Make sure all those that uh, the, that are presenting bills are the ones in here. If you're not presenting a bill or the chair of that committee, um, we can bring in for testimony later on. Um, Senator Hickman, would you uh, lead us in the uh, invocation? Yes, Y'all, let us pray. Lord God, what a wonderful day you've given us. Lord, you've given us a time to meet. You've given us a time to talk. You've given us a time to represent the people of Georgia. Lord, we just ask you to provide us with wisdom and, and, and the knowledge in the Father to do that. Please, uh, please bless, bless this meeting, Lord, in your, in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we're in a uh, very short time frame. Uh, there's stuff that we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to say we're going to have to move quickly on these. If there's questions, too many, we may just have to punt and, and go on um, because there are a lot of, a lot of items to get to. Uh, Representative Stevens, you're up first. Uh, House Bill 317. I've got um, LC451. All right, every, everybody, let's get order in the room here. LC43, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 431905S. Is that what you've got? Okay, go ahead and proceed. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, um, House Bill 317 passed out last year out of the house and it passed out of course this year again this one follows on the heels of the marketplace facilitator bill that passed i don't know a couple of years ago that took care of the disparity of sales tax that was being owed but not being collected this is the same thing that has to do with hotel motel tax uh, and it also collects the five dollar fee for the short-term rentals the vrbo's to place them on a bare, on a level playing field with our hotels that are having to pay these fees that's all the bill does in a nutshell, Mr. Chairman, and I'll just accept any questions if you have any. Um, questions from the committee here? I have a question. All right. Vice Chair Albers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Stevens. I uh, appreciate the incredible work you always do for our hospitality industry. Uh, my, my question is, uh, now that we're going to be adding to this pool that already pay $5, can we not use that as an opportunity to maybe lower it for everybody, even if it's a small amount? Would that be feasible? Uh, you know what? With the $5 fee, we're going to add about $12 million um, across the board uh, in additional revenue. So, uh, And that was an argument that the short-term rentals had. Is, is they Their argument were they were different than the hotels, and the hotels typically are one- to three-day stays. The VRBOs sometimes are a week on average. So if that were the will of the committee, or if they wanted to cap it at a week, that should, or just a few days, so that the hotels would still pay the $5 fee no matter what, but the VRBOs could be capped. Thank you, and a follow up question if I could. I, I guess part of my thought process was, uh, Chairman Stevens said, if it was going to be $5 a day for everybody to try and create parity, which I think is what we're trying to do, could it not be $4 for everybody for every day, just in order, because I, right now, um, I know from the hotel side, not what you're doing, we have the highest hotel motel taxes in the nation right now. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out how we can perhaps carve something out that everybody could win when this is done. I know there's been pushback on the $5 fee on, e on even the, um, the place down in St. Simons. That's a, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the place, but they're essentially a, a Methodist organization that allows people to come in and stay. And they were trying to exempt those, but so there's heartburn on the other side, but I'll take the wisdom of the committee. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions? Senator Jackson, you're on number four. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Stevens, thank you for being here. Um, I see this late arriving amendment. Um, that's AM430196. And my question is simple. Um, could you describe what's a destination marketing organization? A DMO? A DMO, uh, yes, sir. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, this was not my amendment, but it's. Um, uh, I know what the a, a VRBO is, and and I know what the third party administrators are. So if there, I believe what this amendment is trying to attack is if you're a third party administrator, which would be, a, I suppose, the way that they, um, the acronyms go there is if there's a case, they have the opportunity to refund the money back if they're not, if it's collected. 
Mr. Chairman. So, um, yeah, continue. Um, is this your amendment, Mr. Chairman? No, it's not. Oh, oh it's yours? Okay, can you speak on the amendment? Oh, I'll be recognized. I got you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm asking if uh, John Clayton will step in here real quick. Okay, we're, yeah, we may get bogged down here. We may just have to move on and do this in conference. He's right so, here. You want to speak to it? I'm okay. Yeah, uh, quickly, if you want to speak to it at the podium. I don't have the copy in front of me, but the intent was is that uh, the eight, excuse me, thank you. The intent was we have a couple of destinated marketing organizations. In this instance, they're um, CVBs in the area that are over collecting, meaning that they're not able to spend the actual mon money that they've got um, or getting from the hotel motel tax. They have to, they're kind of uh, under a DMO, has to spend it on advertising for, for economic development opportunities. What this would do would allow the money collected in that municipality to go back to that municipality for tourist product development, but only if. In this case, the CBB or the Destinated Marketing Organization agreed. So it's not mandatory, completely permissive. Okay. Any other questions on it? Uh, to, to okay. Is this amendment acceptable you, to you, sir? It, this amendment's fine. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer. What, yes, sir. Yeah. I'm fine with okay. the amendment. Okay. Um, any other uh, questions by the committee? Question on that, that amendment. Okay. Did, did I hear you say that if there was monies left over that weren't spent, they could be returned to the municipality? Some cities don't have a CVB or a mechanism whenever they collect the uh, Port Wentworth in, in my area comes to mind. So should we uh, not just roll the, the hotel rate back for those cities if they're not? Why? I mean, you're paying... If you put the sales tax and the hotel motel tax on, that's 15% in most counties. Is that right? Yes. And then we're going to add five per, five dollars per night. So now you're up to who knows 20% or more. Uh, if there's truly surplus funds in a in a chamber of commerce in Georgia that's not using this money for its intended purpose, they should just give the money back to the people paying it instead of dumping it in their general fund. You know There's some heartburn from that from that point of view, and right. and honestly, the way that the hotel motel taxes are set up, you have these hoteliers that are taxing themselves to market, and half, almost in most of the cases, half of the money from hotel motel taxes go to the city anyway. Right. So the the, the other half is what they're asking to send to the city. So. I, I would imagine there's probably going to be some cities that might have some heartburn with it, or some CVBs, for I'm just sure. the possibility. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, President Pro Tem, what number is that, seven? Seven, I Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to uh, Chairman Stevens for bringing this. I think you mentioned early on that this might be a good, a pl good place for this might be in conference that we could have the individuals involved. I always like for folks to work things out and let us codify it rather than, you know, we sit here in Atlanta and pick winners and losers. I think we should give them the opportunity to work it out. And I, 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 in your judgment or in your wisdom, Mr. Chairman, I would be, I would reinforce your. Okay, your and, and and I said there was going to be a short leash on this stuff. Yeah. We get to discussions. We don't have time today, so so, so if I filibuster, I'll, I'll, if I filibuster, I'll get my way. Is that what you're saying? It, it, well, <laughs> no, I'm just saying we don't have time for long discussions today. So this one probably should wait for a conference committee to get put in. I, Motion I to think. table. Okay. If that's uh, what you want. The the amendment. Yes, sir. Okay. Is there a second to that? No, the, the table, the amendment. If you don't make an amendment to this bill, there will be no conference committee. This bill is not a substitute, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's House Bill 4317 with the LC number. There, If you make no changes to it, it gets engrossed. Therefore, there will be no conference committee. Senator Gooch is correct. How would you like to proceed, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> I'm working on that. Okay, so. So we have to adopt so the we, amendment. If we adopt the amendment, we'll send it to conference. Is or, that what you're saying? Or, or yes. We can make a different amendment. You could, you let's, could change Let's adopt something. the amendment, send it to conference. Okay, so is there a motion to adopt the amendment? So moved. We've got a motion from uh, the President Pro Tem. Is there a second? Second from Senator Thompson. 
All in favor, raise your hand. Um, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, all opposed. Uh, two opposed, I think, okay. The amendment is now on it, so the bill itself is up for uh, a motion. If you want to, uh, if you want to force this to a conference, can I make another amendment? <laughs> 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 the floor's open. I thought we were on the fee. We are, we're gonna have to move real quick. What is that $5 fee you're talking about? What line is that? 62. Line 62? Yeah. Okay, we've got a motion to strike line 62 through 70. Is there a second to that? There. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it dies for lack of a second. Just move. Okay. Thank Give you. me just a minute. Make it 450. This would only strike the new language. We're sending it to committee, I mean to conference. <laughs> okay, go ahead. My substitute motion is uh, to change on line 62, $5 to $4.50. Okay. I bid 449. <laughs> it's a race to the bottom right here. Yeah. All right, 448. May I, Mr. Chairman? Sure. I, I love uh, Senator from the 56 uh, concept of being able to lower it for everybody. Everybody pays a tax, everybody pays less tax. Why don't we come back one year from now and see what we've collected or, uh, or, or what have you and see what the effect is rather than us predicting the effect. Uh, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that you know, sometimes when we think things are to go in the conference committee and in my 11 years we've seen a lot and then all of a sudden the uh, committee subs accepted by the other side and that sucker becomes law. So that's my concern. I got an idea that Senator, uh, that Senator Stevens, <laughs> that Chairman Stevens is gonna hold the line. Okay, so we've had one motion that uh, failed. We've had a motion here. Is there a second to this motion? There's no second, so it dies. Any further, I think we'll do one more and then we're moving. Go, go ahead. I'll have a motion to pass. Okay. Um, We've, we've got a motion to do pass. Is there a second to that? Okay. Well, the amendment failed, didn't it? If, if the First Amendment passed, okay. And then Butch, okay. So we've got a, a motion to pass by substitute with the amendment. Uh, is there a second to that motion? There's a second from Senator Jackson. Any more discussion? All in favor of this, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and opposed. I see three opposed, motion carries. While you're up there, uh, I did wanna look at one other bill here, the historic tax credit, and if we could get him a copy of that. Um, I'm, I'm offering something to keep this process moving, and I did did have the uh, some of them involved want to add something else to it, but couple of concerns I had on the previous one was that it said it had a $25 million cap and let's let's make sure he's got the, the right LC number on this Which, what's our what's our bill? So 469 mr. chairman yeah 469 have we got it in there? No, but I got a copy that uh, might be old. It may have not gotten in the packet. No, I see it right here. Yeah, it's on line 70. 469. Yeah, a couple of things that concerned me on the last one was we thought we had a $25 million cap. 
and the language in there said that those under 300,000 apparently weren't subject to the cap. Yes, sir, that's a different program. That's the one that runs so, the- uh, So there's no, that's an unlimited cap. Correct. That's like individual historic homes. So I, I think we need to look at this going forward and you know we may can find another number in there but um i looked we're supposed to get a report every year the the last report i could see on uh, the website dca gets on from dnr was 2019. okay um so they're not following law on the report apparently the amount under the cap was 25 million the amount on the other part that a lot of people didn't know was there was 45 million correct so yeah. this would put it at Hmm. This would put it at um, $25 million. So that's what I'm proposing to the committee. Somebody uh, proposed a different number to me about 20 minutes before the meeting, and we may consider that. But to keep this moving forward, um, that's what I would like to offer in lieu of a sunset of this bill. So essentially, this just carries it forward with the current numbers correct it carries it far with the current number but it takes out line 70 and 71 which said part of it was subject to no cap at all got it okay i'm good with that and, and we'll we'll um keep this going forward it's different than yours and again this may be in in a conference and work some of that out and i'm amenable to a different number yes sir okay so um this is a substitute to house bill 469 which actually puts a true cap on the program um this will obviously, you know, have to be talked about some more uh, among us, but um, if someone would offer a motion on that right now. I'll uh, move to the two caps and substitute. Uh, second. Got a motion, a second. Any discussion? Um, section two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I might give it to Chuck. Well, it's supposed to, okay. Yeah. Well, this yeah. This right section two. Minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got an amendment, Mr. Chairman. On uh, LC forty four one seven five one S, I'd like to strike section two. Second. All right. That's a that's some new language, and again, that really hasn't been vetted out, so I'm not prepared to go forward on that at this time. I think that's a good point by the vice chair. So let's let's on the amendment first. We've got an amendment. Uh, motion is second to strike section two. Is there any discussion? Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we're back to the original uh, bill with as amended. You want to restate a, a new motion yeah. as amended? I will. I, I move that we do pass uh, the substitute to House Bill 469, LC 44175-1S as amended. All right, is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor um, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. We'll Would you consider carrying the bill, Mr. Chairman? Well, well, we'll we'll look at this going forward, sure. Good, thank you. Okay. I just want to let Chairman Stevens know we appreciate his vote on 148 for our chairman here. Thank you, Duly it was noted. my pleasure. My pleasure. I'm carrying the second. Okay. Uh, Senator Watson stated that he was carrying 317, so he's overruling his House member, I guess. All right. Um, let's move on to um, put my agenda out here. Yeah. So we'll move on to Representative Watson, uh, House Bill 477, if you want to come forward and make sure he's got a copy of it. I did, I did on the previous item put a, a packet in there of the 2019 report on our historic tax credit for those that are interested in it. Okay, 477, and there's also information in here on, um, this is the uh, conservation easement. The members would look at that report um, this is listed at $30 million a year for this conservation easement. If you look at the report, um, 
the total from 2014 was about a little under $19 million total. So I'm, I'm willing to go forward with this, but I'd really like to look at a number for the next five years to say $20 million. And if we jump to that cap in a year or two, you know, well, I think we can go forward. But it seems like if $19 million was more money than we needed for seven years, we don't need $150 million in this program that uh, $20 million ought to cover. So um, I guess on that, and again, this is continuing the conservation easement, and I'll let you talk about it if you want to, but in the meantime for the committee, um, what I would look, like to look at is, uh, is changing lines 11 uh, to uh, $20 million through December 31st, 2026. And, and if Ledge Council will look at that and see if that's looking proper on that one. Um, the, number, the number I was wanting to go to was 20 million for the next five year period, which is more money than has been used in this for the last seven years. So, um, yeah, and I, I know these have been a source of some controversy too, so I was trying to be, you know, something that would hit it, so. I guess I'd like to offer 20 if, if the committee could be okay with that. You want to talk about the program briefly and tell us what it does? Um, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I can touch on it real quick. We've, uh, we've conserved over 50,000 acres in the last uh, six years with this uh, piece of legislation. Um, our state's continuing to grow. Uh, we need to make sure that we conserve our natural resources. That's part of what we do uh, in this bill. Um, and I'm amenable to, to lowering the maximum because uh, the chairman is correct. It, it has not been used to its full capacity. Uh, but there are some, some very strong restrictions when you enter into this program, uh, which, which do restrict uh, landowners from participating. So I think lowering it um, is, is, is very reasonable. And I do know the, the federal IRS has had some concerns in the last year or so about some of these values being way overstated to get additional credit so it's going on right now so anyway I, I think this would 20 instead of 150 would be a reasonable move but it's the will of the committee um, is it, let me, let me, we haven't had an amendment put forward yet on that so um, that would be line 11 changing it to uh, $20 million through December 31st, 2026. Okay, we've got a motion and a second on those. Any discussion on that? All right. Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we're talking about you're limiting it to $20 million annually and capping Not $20 million it. annually, $20 million total. $20 million total. Through, right. through 2026 mm -hmm. for five years, which is more than has been used for seven years. Okay. Yeah, it just shall not exceed twenty million dollars. Period. Period. Okay. Through, it says per through, year. through 2026, you know the 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 sunset. Um, you you want to weigh in on that, Blake? Because um, uh, six. Six. Okay. Sure. So, the the way this the way this is now, there's a five year period, January 1, 2016, to the end of 2021, and there's a 30 million cap per calendar year. If the if that thirty million dollars is changed to twenty, that would be per calendar year. The the question is if we're are you intending to renew it for five more years at up to twenty million dollars per year? Twenty twenty million dollars total. Okay. So Yeah, let me let me see let him finish here though. Yeah, fin so it would be a, a, a new period. So this would close out December 31st, 2021, as, mm -hmm. as it were. And then it would be an amendment to allow for a, a new five-year period. And throughout the five-year period, it can't exceed 20 million in total. Okay. Correct. So if we just said, shall it not, not exceed $20 million period or 20 million total through December 31st, 2026? I would just want to close it out so that this current five-year period is, is closed out and then have a new uh, five-year period where it's capped at 20 years over the five-year period. Okay. So January 1st, 2022, you're saying? Yes. Until so December 31st, 2026? Yes. Uh, it will continue not to exceed $20 million in total? Yes. 
So okay. essentially repeating the paragraph, but with. I'm, I didn't have his own, you're correct. So. Chairman, is it? Um, just to, let me let him finish here. All right, so we're going we're gonna to amend uh, Senator Gooch's original amendment, uh, and we're going to um, keep the existing language that was there before anything was changed or highlighted uh, in lines 10 through 13, and then beginning on a new line 14, beginning on January 1st of 2022, uh, the aggregate amount of tax credit allowed in this code session shall not exceed $20 million uh, in total uh, allowed in this code section to December 31st, 2026. Okay. We've got that. Is there a second to that? And then we'll get to you. We've got a second from Senator Payne. Okay. Senator Hickman, uh, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, would you go back because of, uh, I don't think I agree with what, what y'all just did, but you go back to what you said originally about how, how you looked at this for a period of time for seven years and how much it was for those period of time. Go back and reiterate that again. It was 18 million. It's in your, it's in your folder here under this right here with a spreadsheet from 2014 forward. Um, it was $18,631,232 since the program inception in 2014 total. Okay, so that's not, okay. That's not per year, that's in total. So we're saying we'll give 20 million for five years, which is a higher number than was used for seven years. Okay. I got you. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I'm so we've got a motion and a second. Um, any other discussion on the amendment? If not, um, all in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so now we've got an amended House Bill 477. I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman. All right. Motion to pass committee substitute, perfected committee substitute as amended. That's what you're supposed to say. All right, we need a second. Second, sir. Okay, second from the President Pro Tem. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Hearing none. Okay, motion carries. And um, let's see, I believe you've got um, 586 here as well, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, and we'll get you a, a copy of that and, and what it includes. There's, there's quite a bit in there, including the Lockheed, which um, I know uh, Senator Reeves has a little interest in too, so. Yes, sir. I mean, Representative, I'm promoting him already, aren't I? That's a good sign. <laughs> Okay, so this one has, um, trying to go through it here, uh, let me see if I can get the summary. It might be easier to do it off the summary than looking at the bill. But it, it has in there the items of, uh, there was an exemption on some ticket sales that we wanted to go forward with um, the uh, concrete uh, exemption they'd actually proposed some different language on that and this doesn't get into the new language it just simply says we'll extend it out another five years mm -hmm. um, it extends the the boat out another year so that it shows our intention of going forward with that uh, the, the boat repairs and um, then it um, also extends the, the railroad out. I heard different opinions on this. I don't know that this is necessary because it wasn't going to expire till 2024, but it gives it a five year sunset um, through 2026, keeps it within five years. But um, those from the railroad industry were fine with that. And, matter of fact, uh, while some others had thought we needed to go ahead and move on that after this bill was written, they didn't, but I'm fine with leaving it in there. And then the last part, of course, is the Lockheed bill part. So, um, I'm not. I can't remember who did the the Lockheed, uh, and it was Bruce, wasn't it? So, yeah. let me go through that again. The the tel the sales tax exemption that came over from the House is in there. The uh, concrete mixing exemption that was offered a substitute 
is just simply put back to another five year extension to go forward with that for right now. The um, railroad extension on, on that we, the short line railroads where we pay 50% of their um, cost up to $3,500 per mile is still in there through 2026. And then the last item, of course, is uh, Lockheed. So let me ask the chair of this bill what he would prefer to speak on and what he would prefer others to speak on. Um, I can I can speak real briefly uh, on the, the performing arts. Um, obviously, that, that, it, that sector of our economy has been hit really hard, not being able to have performances. Um, so this is just a, a one-year short-term opportunity for them to to regain some some uh, assets and some some money uh, going forward, and we can reevaluate it uh, next year with the short-term sunset. But um, they're vital to our local communities and uh, and and uh, very good. Um, the uh, the uh, boat retrofits piece, obviously, we've we've got some uh, job creation there, and we've got some people that are coming to our state to do these major, uh, extremely large retrofits, half a million dollar type retrofits. Um, and so extending that out allows them some security in, in any kind of major infrastructure that they want to invest and put down roots in our state. Um, and so it's a, a very good uh, piece of the bill as well. Um, and the uh, the concrete truck piece, obviously they are, are a huge economic uh, engine or allow us to have uh, build economic engines in our state. And so uh, these these trucks that are that are on the roads and, and, and mixing the concrete and doing this, people are still paying sales taxes on the concrete. They're still paying motor fuel taxes. Um, we're still obtaining a lot of revenue from what these trucks do. And the actual process of, of manufacturing concrete uh, is part of that truck. They, they have to mix it and, and stir it for the concrete to, to form and, and do what it's supposed to do. So it is part of the manufacturing process. Um, but they also generate a lot of revenue for us. And um, I don't know if uh, Chairman Reeves, Leader Reeves, wants to uh, talk on the Lockheed uh, piece. Uh, but I think those are my pieces within this bill currently, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any questions on, on the sections he covered? Yeah. Make sure. Yeah. We've got, what I've got here is LC 432023S. Okay. And Senator Albers got a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when you actually started, you talked about the boat maintenance. I don't see that in the bill. Is that taken out? Um, so I'm, I may be in another section one. Four. Section four. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. All right, Senator Gooch. Ch Chairman Watson, I knew you were a great fan and study of Thomas Carlyle, but I did not know you were a big fan of the ballet. <laughs> so. I admire you. Uh, Senator, I have four daughters at home, so. Uh, uh, that I, explains I, it. I, I, yeah. <laughs> you're, a, you're a softie, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. <laughs> I, w I will have to say, if I was buying a $10 museum ticket, probably the 70 cents wouldn't keep me that from going. It's, it's the $5 it. service charge and the 250 processing fee they put on That's it. it. So, um, all right. Yeah, let me, well, you're, you're Mike 10. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I had heard mention of uh, the interest of, by the zoos. I was reminded by Dr. Rett's tie today that the zoos are, uh, would be very interested in, in, in being relieved of that, this temporary relief of sales tax. Is that on your radar screen? Is that, repeat that one Zoo, more time. Zoos, zoos. Uh, well, I, I had some question about putting them in too, and it's really too late. Again, they, we can look at this in a conference. Uh huh. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had that question. Okay. Um, who would be the best on Lockheed? I don't know. The original sponsor Please was Chairman here. Williamson, but I think Burt Reese would, uh, the representative from uh, Marietta Cobb County. I think Lockheed might be there, huh? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Committee, and, and obviously um, we've worked with Lockheed on this, but so the committee, just for clarification, 
um, any company that's in the, the aerospace industry that would otherwise qualify would be eligible for, if, if, if this becomes law, would be eligible for um, this incentive to sit at the table in order to try to win the bids of some big things that are coming down. And this is a generational changing kind of stuff right here. Over the next few years, the Department of Defense is going to be rolling out the three military aviation um, fighter jets that are going to be the future of the United States military. And um, Georgia has an incredible opportunity to be the epicenter of that. This bill um, is basically the, the, the package that would allow Georgia to competitively bid for these three projects, one of which is going to, the bidding will be over by um, December of this year, so the first of which of these is happening in this year. Um, this will bring thousands of jobs um, to Georgia, whether it be Lockheed or somebody else, and uh, approximately 3,000 engineering jobs. We know, everybody in this building knows my affinity to Georgia Tech, but we also have engineering students that we produce from University of Georgia, from Kennesaw State, and from Georgia Southern. And this, these are the kind of jobs that young engineers, is a dream job for young engineering students. Um, this will also, it, it, keeping Georgia, it, you, everybody in this room knows that Lockheed has had a long history with the Department of Defense, but we also know that some of those projects are, are being phased out. And our relevance in military aviation um, isn't as strong as it used to be. If we can land one or two or maybe even all three of these projects, and that changes that for up to 40 years, there's been an independent uh, report done that shows that this stands to have a 12 billion plus impact over on Georgia. Um, this is a great opportunity for our state. This is the kind of things that we need to be involved with. And it truly is a generational opportunity. Um, I'll be happy to stand for any questions. I, d I do want to add that we didn't feel like there was a proper uh, clawback in this That's bill. Right. You know, it's one of those things if you have to do this, but then if you don't do it, nothing happens. Um, and so we put some language in here that that puts a true claw back in it. Uh, we welcome that, so thank all you. All right, uh, Senator Hickman. Sir, I, I appreciate your uh, representing the different schools in Georgia that have engineering schools, but are you also aware that Georgia Southern has the only manufacturing engineering school in the state of Georgia? In fact, we got the only manufacturing school, engineering school within 500 miles. Are you aware of that? I was not, but um, we would love to have some Georgia Southern students come and, and re relocate in Marietta. There's all kinds of great places for young people to live, and they could uh, have a short commute to. I have been told by some of the lobbyists that the Georgia Southern students actually uh, manage the Georgia Tech students. Ooh, <laughs> you really put me in a spot right now. <laughs> if the gentleman so speaks. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, can uh, can you get Represent uh, Chairman Blackman a copy of this bill? Um, yeah, we we uh, any any more questions from the author himself? Um, if not, uh, Senator Gooch, what what's your interest here? First, I'd like to thank you for bringing this, and I think out of all the tax credits that we have passed in recent years, this one probably has the most benefit to Georgia uh, for good high quality jobs. I mean, I really believe this could be the one that lands some major jobs for our state. Uh, and I do appreciate your work on that clawback provision. I think it's lines 323 through 331. But in the on lines 323 and 330, you have a five year uh, provision. And I think the time that it takes to ramp up these programs, it's something this significant. I think five years is probably too short, and I was going to ask if we can make that 10 years. So I would I would, I would, I would agree with that. Okay, thank you. So on line 323, I would amend, uh, I would strike fifth and replace with 10th. And then on line 330, strike fifth and replace with the word 10th. Is that, is that clear? Okay. So we've got an amendment 
offered. Is there a second to Senator Gucci's amendment? Second, second from Senator Thompson. So now the the bill itself. Uh, any other questions from the committee members? Senator Jackson. Can you repeat that amendment on 323? Yes. Line 323 instead of saying within 60 days after the close of the fifth taxable year, it would now read within 60 days after the close of the tenth taxable year. And then the same would be on line 330 where it reads close of the fifth taxable year would now read close of the tenth taxable year. Okay, so we've got a motion and a second on amending this to 10 years. Um, any discussion on that? If not, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed to this amendment? I don't see any. Okay, any other questions by the committee on any parts of this bill? Senator, uh, uh, President Pro Tem down there. Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the section on uh, marine maintenance, mm -hmm. I think it's section four. Can, is there anybody to speak to that? Um, what what we were trying to do was go out an additional year. I, I really don't like doing that, but there was some question about, you know, people wondering about our, our commitment. And so this would extend it another year, but yet still keep it the five-year window we try to hold to on everything. And that's something I th I'd rather discuss that, you know, as the bill moves forward if we could. Uh, that would be fine, and I would defer to your uh, judgment and wisdom on on that issue, if we, as long as we're mm -hmm. stating that we want to continue it at a five-year pace, I don't think we can expect these folks to come in, whether it's aerospace or marine or what have you, and make uh, tremendous economic commitments, and they only have a five-year window. So uh, I think that. We, All right. Thank you. Yes, Senator Gooch. I, I don't remember the details of the boat credit, but was there a clawback provision in that bill when it passed here a few years ago? I don't remember. So I, I like the clawback language that you put in this bill, and I think we should consider that in future tax credits going forward. Yeah, you know, there has to be accountability and performance measures put in these bills. I mean, a lot of times there's not sunsets, there's not clawbacks, That's right. and um, there's really no auditing on some of these things. It's right. just self-reporting, and you know, I, I think we need to tighten up on this, Senator Senator Albers. Mr. Chairman, isn't it true if we would set, just pass Senate Bill Six? Uh, then we could measure these. We wouldn't have that problem anymore. I think the vice chair knows what he speaks. Um, okay, so we've got an amendment to the. Yeah. Um, the. Um, uh, if you want to address this, you can. All right, thank you. All right, we've got an uh, amendment to the bill. I think we don't have a motion on the bill itself, though, do we? We've got a motion from Senator Gooch and a second from Senator Thompson. Any other discussion on this? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed to this? All right, motion carries. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Your Christmas tree's there, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Seriously, thank you. All right. Um, Senator, I mean, uh, let's see here. We've got who next? Representative Jaspers uh, has got a bill he's going to explain to us. This is one because of the late breaking sub that we don't have a summary on. My understanding of it, and you guys can tell me wrong, is that the railroads felt like their fuel that they use for railroad should be dedicated to railroad use. This, but Thank you. it's not going to be subject to the 1% cap at this time, I think, from other things. But there is a, a provision that's been put in some other things that says if it doesn't get dedicated to that, it drops by 50%. And then... If it continues to not be there, it drops to nothing. So that's sort of the the poison in it, uh, I would say. Um, so anyway, that's my short version of it, from my understanding. Um, Senator Gooch has worked pretty hard on this too, I think. So 
maybe he can help you out if you need some help. Uh, go ahead, Representative. Well, Jack thank you, Bruce. Chairman. I, I probably will need a lifeline. I look forward to my senator, uh, Gooch, for helping me with that. But, you know, this House Bill 588 has been a, a, a work that's been going on for over a year. You know, when we had the freight commission work that many of you are members of and our members of and many members of the public worked on, this is the, probably the beginning of the recommendations and fulfilling some of the things that they wanted. And uh, it's been really a, a great, for me as a new chairman of um, transportation, it's been a great learning experience to get to work with everybody. I'll go through it pretty quickly because I know y'all are, we have a lot, there's a lot going on. Okay, in section one, you know, it creates a definition of public benefit for freight projects. And remember, this bill is about freight, and uh, it's been just it's the backbone of what we do in the state of Georgia. It's creating that public benefit. It's a very important, it allows for P3, you know, our public private partnerships. We're, you know, just think about it where we may have the land, somebody else has the money, they can create a partnership or any option of those three to work. Uh, it's just a neat thing. One example I think everybody uses a lot is it easier to continue a rail siding in a community or build a bridge, which is easier and more cost effective for us to do. Sections two, three, and four are very similar. They do two things. They're updating language allowing DOT or GDOT and CERTA. The authority to make clear that they can do these P3 and intermodal and multimodal projects and uh, also allows some toolbox language that you'll see in the bill, and I'll point out in a minute, to work on big projects. Big projects like the Talmadge Bridge that's coming up and, uh, and gives the right framework for it to do that. If you look over on page 11, you'll see new code section on alternative contracting. This is, boy, have everybody in the buildings worked on this, uh, outside parties, attorneys, to make sure the language does what it wants to to allow these things. There's a lot of look back and making sure that uh, the DOT board's involved, they're approving it, that, that these big projects have local people working in them. It's uh, been a good one. Uh, you look at section six, this is like the chairman said a moment ago, this is following on to House Bill 511, the dedicated fees bill. It's really making sure that those triggers are still there that were in House Bill 170. You know, about the fees, you know, one's on hotels and one's on the impact fees for, on heavy vehicles. The same part is in section seven. You know, it's, in sevens, it's the logical down payment on freight. You know, we talk about funding improvements. This actually does it, really targets the dollars that diesel used by locomotives will be used for funding freight logistic projects. It's about a little less than $10 million, give or take some in different years. Uh, but it's all about the consumption of fuel, of fuel and to target where it goes. Like I said, Section 8 is the same with Section 6. And Section 9, you know, one of the recommendations of the Freight and Logistics Commission was to um, put the DOT commissioner on the um, Port Authority Board. During a discussion earlier, it was also suggested that maybe the state planning director could be a part of that also. That's the bill, does a lot, and uh, I really appreciate, you know, uh, we, Mr. Chairman, we always got to appreciate our attorneys. Uh, Jenna Dole has worked incredibly hard on this with all the different uh, folks. That's what worries me is when those attorneys work on it. And uh, well, slip well howdy. <laughs> well, I'll try to answer any questions, and I may throw a lifeline, but I sure appreciate it. Okay, uh, Senator Jackson. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being yes. here. On Section 9, let's be clear on the Department of, uh, of, of the Georgia Port Authority. That would be a non-voting member. Am I correct? Yes, serve as an ex officio member. So, so yes, so sir. A non-voting member. That would be a non-voting, yes, sir. And the Director of Planning of the Department of Transportation, that, that person works for the commissioner? And appointed by the governor, yes. It's appointed by the governor. I don't know how that, you know, we have to get Senator Gooch. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm on section four, section uh, 461 to 464. Yes. Um, my question is the director of the planning of the Department of Transportation. 
is that person, does that person work for the commissioner or works for the governor's office? I can, office? Answer. I, can, I can answer that. Before I was elected to the Senate, I was actually on the DLT board at the time, and it was a, this became an office that was created by Senate Bill 200. I believe Senator Mullis carried that legislation that year. It creates a director of planning that is appointed solely by the governor of the state. And that person reports directly to the governor. They are in charge of helping to prepare the STIP, which is Statewide Transportation Improvement Plan, puts together the programming for all the projects around the state. They do not report to the commissioner. The commissioner of DOT is hired by the board of the transportation department. So your DOT board members that we elect every year hire and fire the commissioner with input from the governor, I would imagine, but the director of planning works directly for the governor. Thank you, Senator. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Gooch. Okay, um, any questions by the committee? Senator Gooch, you wanna give a summary? I've given one, the representative has. Yeah, I think the representative did a good job. He ran through it pretty quick. <clears throat> Section one deals with the that I guess you would say the constitutionality issues, but if you know a lot of your districts, you have grade crossings, a lot of railroad crossings, and you're hearing a lot of complaints from constituents about trains sitting uh, and blocking a lot of those, those intersections. This would free up some state funding through this Freight Logistics Commission to be able to help fund some of those crossings uh, at grade and separated grades as well. You would be able to bridge over some of those major intersections to where those trains would no longer have to sit there. That's the intent of this language. It would get, a, get around the, the, you know, the gratuities issue that's in the Constitution. These crossings, most of them are always on state, house, state right of ways or you know, on the, the crossings of the, of the class one railroad. So that's the reason for the, the language in section one. Uh, the section about construction management, engineer, general contractor is a new topic in Georgia in contracting, but it's not new across the, uh, across the country. This would allow for GDOT to pick a small number of projects every year with a limited number of dollars to where they could hire consultants. And we'll use an example, the bridge in Savannah. There's a lot of talk about whether the bridge in Savannah needs to be replaced, moved, and, and raised to a higher level so bigger ships would be able to come in and out. That's just one example. We have a, a, a potential of being able to elevate that bridge and leave it in place. but the Department of Transportation needs some expertise in being able to do that. So they're looking to bring in these consultants, their construction managers, who are also general contractors. But I don't think we have a contractor in Georgia that's big enough to handle this kind of a project, but this provision in this bill would allow them to bring those experts in in advance and work with them through the design phase and the, you know, the construction phase of that. And so that's just one example. There's others in multimodal and other parts of the DOT. So I think that's the primary reason for that. And it would be limited to a small number of projects. What is it now in here, Rick? Three projects or? Two. Two projects per year? Yes, sir. And it would be limited in the dollar amounts as well. So we don't want to use this everywhere and we don't want to use it on typical projects that a, a typical highway contractor would qualify for so we want to limit the use of that so the department doesn't uh, just get you know conveniently using that method so i think that clears that up pretty easily what's the next section <coughs> Section four, section five. I think that I think that covers it for the. They're part. similar, yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The section six. That's the ten percent. Um, that's the clawback provision on on um, collecting these funds. So let's talk a little bit about the the uh, locomotive tax. Currently, all your railroads are buying diesel fuel for their locomotives. Obviously, locomotives don't drive up and down the highways. Motor fuel tax is, is dedicated to motor f for roads and bridges today. The fuel that is being purchased by the Class One railroads and the other short line railroads, that sales tax for motor fuel goes into the general fund. 
this would simply dedicate that that tax to the department to be used for this freight and logistics commission so what we're looking for is we're looking for a, a steady dependable revenue stream of funds that we can continue to plan and develop some of these improvements around the state and not always have to compete with the general budget so we believe if you're going to generate the revenue off of that fuel consumption it ought to go back for that purpose and so it's sort of consistent with what we're doing with you know the the uh, transit fees that we dedicated last year under House Bill 105 and with House Bill 170 when we adopted the hotel motel fees, we put that trigger in there that says if you don't use all of the money for that purpose, then the next year the fee would be reduced to half and then after the second year it would be completely eliminated. That just makes sure that the funds are utilized for its intended purpose. All right. Any questions of the committee on this? Um, again, this has been changed from the House version. Um, yes, it has. And um, many times. Yeah, <laughs> you guys have worked me hard over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do have a an amendment if you'll entertain it here in just a few minutes. Okay. If I can get my hands on it. Where did it go? I know they've got so many bills they send over to us, it's hard to keep up with them all, <laughs> isn't it? Here we go. Hand this to let, me, let me hand this out. Instead of trying to do it verbally, uh, this came in over to last minute, um, but it's just a, it's basically just a cleanup amendment. Can you pass that down? This would go in line 416. Uh, make sure we got the right LC number we do it's LC 3069 ERS You think you need this to tighten it up a little bit more? Yes, or? yes. And this is a friendly amendment, Mr. Chairman. We okay. absolutely agree. Hmm. Okay. Any? Everybody had a chance to see the amendment. Any questions? Okay, Senator Payne. Um, let me turn you on over there. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to uh, add the amendment uh, presented to this LC 393069ERS. Second. Okay, we've got an amendment and a second to insert after line 16 the sales and use tax described in subsection B and appropriated to the Department of Transportation shall be utilized for capital construction or routine maintenance on frail rate assets owned or leased by a common carrier regulated by the United States Service surface Transpo transportation board located on or connected to publicly owned railroad railroads publicly owned roads and allocated on a formula determined by total miles of track operated in the state of georgia so we got a motion and a second to amendment with this all in favor say aye, aye. any opposed so the the uh, substitute bill has now been amended i have one other amendment if you don't mind sir mm. short this very is the last short. one right yep this is it <laughs> So if you go back to section nine at the very end of the bill, Senator Lester Jackson was asking about that uh, on the planning director. We'd want to remove the director of planning of the Department of Transportation or his or her designee from this bill. So if we could, we would, at, on line 462, it would read commissioner of transportation or his or her designee and then strike that remaining line and then on the first part of 463 strike it over to where the word shall is and it, you would say shall serve as an ex officio member of the authority so we would basically restore that language and the rest of that line so if i could i'll read it uh, line 462 would now read commissioner of transportation or his or her designee shall serve as an ex officio member of the authority all right we've got an amendment number two offered by senator gooch is there a second question um, 
representative on the Port Authority? The governor, the governor appoints, the governor appoints all the members. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But let me let me just say this: the I don't know that having both on there is necessary, but I do believe it's important that we have the, our commissioner of DOT on the Ports Authority for as an ex officio member. Uh, if y'all know, we have spent a lot of taxpayers' money trying to build that network down there in and out of, of the ports. And I think the, the the value of having the commissioner on there would be tremendous. And I think the Ports Authority would support this change that we're making today. All right, we've got an amendment and a question, but we don't have a second yet to the amendment. Second by Senator Jackson. All in favor of the amendment number two, say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, we've got a, uh, two amendments on a substitute bill. Perfecting them, right? So is there a motion now? I will move, uh, Chairman Huffstetler, that we uh, we do pass House Bill 588 LC number 393069ERS as perfected by this <laughs> great body. With two amendments on it. Yes. Is there a second, second to that? Second by Senator Albers. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. And um, maybe if he's trying to fix Senate Bill 6 for Senator Albers, you can be over there and help out this time. I, I made the motion and rules today to move back to Ways and Means. Okay. <laughs> Thank um, you all. Thank thanks. you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Gooch. Yes, sir. Senator Payne. Um, we've got uh, now item. Uh, let me pull my agenda back out now. But this is uh, Representative Dickey of the 140th wanting to look at an avalorum tax if you want to come up to the podium here. All right, uh, you don't look like Representative Dickey, but. Um, I, I, I don't, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for that. Yeah, um, less and less. May I just address uh, you, Mr. Chair, for just a moment and then uh, ask Representative Washburn to come forward or I was just gonna give you a, a little over you, but if you wanna hear from him first, that's fine. All right, no, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I, first, I wanna thank the chair for being flexible. Uh, this is something we've been working on diligently between the House uh, and the Senate to come up with what is what we're calling the OLOST legislation, um, or proposed legislation. And I've got, if I may, Mr. Chair, I'll bring you these copies. Okay, you can give them to Diego here to hand out. And that, that's really it, uh, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to let you know what the status of the documents were. We had one last minute change as well since the committee started. And um, to let you know that this is the final version or proposed version uh, or substitute to what you and I had spoken about earlier in the day, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I'll turn it over to. Well, what, are, what are the changes in this substitute? Yes, sir. The changes are uh, twofold. One, if you'll look on lines 42. There's a reference to the interim millage rollback for the second year that the OLOST is in effect. And it initially in the bill from the House required a, on line 42, property within such political subdivisions by seven mills. We have changed that to five mills, Mr. Chairman. And then secondly, on line 98, page five, we've added some language, uh, paragraph little i. This is what we've referred internally to as the pilot language, which in essence accommodated if in fact by referendum, if Bibb County decides to make in Bibb, consolidated government decides to by referendum to elect itself to add the one penny sales, pack ta one penny sales tax pursuant to the OLAS provision, um, then if that referendum passes, we would need to make sure that for the specific economic development programs where a pilot is in effect, a payment in lieu of taxes, that that would remain undisturbed. And so this is the language uh, that um, council have, has drawn up and le legislative council has inserted it here, line 98 through 108. 
and I think if I'll ask Representative Washburn, I think those are the only two changes, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee, uh, in what you see as LC 441754S, as in Sierra, should be the substitute that we're offering now. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Washburn. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kennedy and uh, Chairman Huffstella, members of the committee. Uh, this bill, we had a uh, unanimous request from the mayor and the commission members in Macon Bibb County to pass uh, an old lost bill for them. This code section allows an added penny only for consolidated governments in Bibb County. And so this is the product of what we had done here. Of course, uh, the senator has gone through uh, the amendments. Basically, what it does is a referendum. If they vote to add a penny sales tax, uh, they would receive, a, 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 based on the estimates of sales tax revenue, they would receive about $8 million this year from the last quarter's collection if it passes. Next year, after the rollback, they would get uh, from 10 to $11 million in addition. So. It does two things. It provides them with some needed revenue that they can use uh, for operational uh, purposes, and it also provides five mills in a uh, rollback of property tax in Bibb County for 2022. And then in 2023 and forward, the calculation of the sales tax is applied to the millage rate and it's rolled back 100% uh, then going forward. There's a five-year sunset. The people get to vote on it again in five years. If, to uh, decide whether or not they will continue. So it does two things, provide some property tax relief, but also provide some needed revenue uh, for Bibb County's government. All right. Um, questions of the committee? Every time I make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We've got a, Senator Albers, go ahead. Uh, I move uh, we do pass uh, House Bill 575, 44175-4S. Second by Senator Jones. Um, any other discussion on this? All in favor, say aye. Chairman, oh, aye. yes, go ahead. Does maybe the sponsor or maybe uh, our uh, senator from the 18th would, could tell us, does this have in, uh, unintended consequences on other consolidated governments around the state and I'm thinking of uh, Augusta in particular and possibly Columbus and others um, Mr. Project Pro Tem it, it does in the sense that it changes that code section that applies only to uh, consolidated governments and the reason we had to do this as a general bill is because some of the uh, aspects of the original legislation that applies to Columbus mm -hmm. had some things in it, such as a frozen assessment. And so we went to Ledge Council, and they have uh, changed. Uh, we did. It, it does change the code section. And certainly, uh, Chairman Kennedy may want to speak to that as well. Thank you, Mr. Pro Tem. I, I would just add that uh, in addition to uh, what Representative Washburn said with regard to the way the OLAST statute was originally written, it really was written for Muskogee, uh, Columbus. Correct. And, it, and, and because their government already had a property valuation freeze in place, the statute encompassed that. Macon Bibb didn't want that as a part of this, nor would I think probably any other consolidated government because I don't think that's been a positive thing uh, as folks from Columbus would tell you. So the statute was drafted so that future consolidated governments could take advantage of not having to go through a property valuation freeze process first before you then went to the referendum stage to the citizens in the county. Um, so this really provides more flexibility in that regard. And so it sets up the model by which works well here. And I think other consolidated governments could avail themselves of in the future. Uh, thank you for that response. Has any discussion occurred with the sponsor or with others from Macon with uh, the city of Muskogee, Muskogee uh, Columbus uh, Consolidated Government, or Augusta uh, Consolidated Government, and I'm I'm just cautious about this because what we don't want to do is, but 
I'm not opposed to your bill, and I'm, I want to help you, but I, I don't want to have unintended consequences for other folks, and, and I know that they're, they're enjoying a very low um, millage rate in uh, Augusta, for instance, and I'm not sure that how this would affect it. Well, I, th this would not affect the millage rate, the property values, the property assessment values, or whatever loss that Augusta may have or athens Clark may have. The only way this would impact them is if that consolidated government decided to avail itself of this statute and have an O loss, and the O stands for other, but it's still a local option sales tax. So under this statute, it is the other local option sales tax, and it's where the consolidated government has elected or wishes to put the second penny of two pennies that are available for sales tax. So if Augusta wants to do this, they can travel under the OLA statute under these terms, and the rest of the process is the same. They still have to go through a referendum, uh, just as Bibb did, just as Columbus did. If anything, it would be easier for Augusta or any of the consolidated governments to have an OLOS now because they could elect to go through the property valuation freeze process, and if that happens, then have the referendum and then apply it, or under the modifications made in the statute here, they don't have to go through that. They could go through this far less burdensome model to elect to have the referendum. And if the people voted in, they voted in. If they don't, they don't. If it comes in, then what happens is you have real property tax relief by the amount of the sales tax revenue. There's a mandatory rollback mm -hmm. of your millage rate. So it helps property tax, uh, it helps property owners, uh, and it's a sharing of the tax burden, but it is ultimately revenue neutral. I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the unintended consequences and, and um, uh, uh, expressing my concern. And, and further, I'm even more concerned that when this bill goes out of here, it's engrossed. So uh, I, I guess I'm unclear, and I don't want to do something that's going to uh, negatively impact or inadvertently impact or affect other communities. And I'm going to trust that the gentleman at the podium, both of which <laughs> are learned individuals, know of what they speak. I am answering your questions. I am answering them yeah, fully, okay, Mr. Prosim. Sure I, 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 I don't I think you you're are. suggesting otherwise, but yeah. I, I guess where I'm struggling is I'm not, I don't know what unintended consequence you're thinking or worried about mm -hmm. because and I'm happy to go through the model there's again. So, I just there's, there's so few uh, consolidated governments in this state. Um, there's some unknown. I'm I'm, un, I'm unsure about it, but I, and I I, I share okay. some of your concerns on, on that. I will say there is an opportunity this time of the year only in rules to 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 look at something that we may could. King Solomon himself yeah, couldn't have been uh, more just. They, they just <laughs> just changed a couple of years ago, I believe, to that. But uh, thank you, thank you. I, I do share your concerns. Thank you very much. That, that yeah. uh, makes makes me feel much better. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman, and, and I hope you'd be open to a friendly amendment if there was some some uh, some concern. I, I would, and absolutely, and I would say one other thing that just sort of as an additional safety valve, if for some reason two, ten, twenty years from now, Augusta or athens Clark decides that they want to avail themselves of the OLOS, they can revisit the statute. And if the statute doesn't really fit for the circumstances, they can do simply what Macon Viv has done. They can look at tweaking a little yep. bit so that it does work for yep. them. Great. Thanks, yeah. sir. Appreciate Thank it. you. All right. Senator Jones, did you have something? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm part of the, I think the question has been answered. I'm part of the Bib delegation with Senator Kennedy. And, and I had concerns when we were talking about, um, you know, this effect and being a general bill affecting the Athens and Augustas and Columbuses of the world as well. But I think the changes that Representative Washburn and Senator Kennedy have, um, and as well as others, uh, Representative Dickey as well, I think this addresses, at least addressed my concern in the fact that if, if these other consolidated governments wanted to add that extra penny, uh, they could do exactly what Bibb County's mm -hmm. getting ready to do. So, so I had the same concerns, uh, Mr. Pro Tem, and I and I think this language satisfies them. All right. Any other questions from the committee? If not, I guess we're ready for a motion, or do we get one? We already got a motion, didn't we? And a second. Okay. Um, all in favor of this, I guess raise your hand. Um, let's see how many we got here. One, two, 
Mm -hmm. Are you a, a yes or a no? You're an, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and all those opposed, raise your hand. Uh, some people didn't vote, I don't think, here, but uh, you're a yes, okay, and you're no, okay. All right, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You much. All right, uh, one other item of business. I had told the uh, uh, sponsor of that House Bill 160, I would give them an up or down vote with no discussion. Some things happened since then, and I have held off on that, but I'm willing to let that happen at this time. We've, we already had a hearing on the bill. There, there wouldn't be another hearing on that bill. So House Bill 160, that was the, the most that would be the same as the Atlanta schools. It's not in there, but I can get you a copy of it um, if you need to look at it. But I really wasn't open for discussion on it per se, just basically an up or down vote. I told him he asked for another hearing. I said, I'm not going to give him another hearing, just an up or down vote. Okay, um, yes. No, we weren't going to do another hearing on it. I told him we wouldn't have a, a, another hearing. I guess we probably have time for a couple of questions if we want to do them or. Sure, go ahead and do a motion first, then we'll have discussion. Now the the one I thought I had was forty three seventeen eighty seven. You want to do it? Okay. Okay. All right. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second by Senator Jackson. So now we'll have a discussion. Senator Alpers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thought the last time we talked about this bill, one of the uh, questions was with the latest um, omnibus uh, bill from D.C., the $1.9 trillion, that there was possibly an outlet because there was billions and billions of dollars dedicated to things of this nature that we were supposed to get some information back if that was going to be a way that they could fund this. I have I, I empathize with their situation completely and I want to help them, but we opened up Pandora's box by doing this, and if there's an outlet right now where they can get that money, and I believe, if I remember, the bill's author was going to be talking to our former colleague, uh, Congressman Williams, to do that. So did we get a response on that? I, I, I don't recall an extension agreement, but she said that she just decided Well, I'm not saying an agreement, but she said that they already, I think they had scheduled to talk to her uh, one more time and already talked to her twice. Okay. That's what I thought, but that's right. <laughs> All right. Any other questions from the Senator Jackson, number four? Yes, sir. Um, as I understand, Mr. Chairman, I believe this uh, House Bill 160 is really needed by the city of South Fulton. No, East Point. East Point. East Point. College Point. Point. Okay. Okay. Hateville. Okay. And, and, okay. And I just realized my mic was off, so sorry. Um, that motion did carry six to three. And um, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Oh.